Warning, fungal pathogen detected. Begin explanation protocol. I consider The Last of Us to be a masterpiece, an exceptionally well-written and acted piece of drama flawlessly translated through a PlayStation controller. With the sequel and the story on my mind, I thought today would be a good time to go through everything you need to know about this surprisingly scientifically grounded game. And I assure you, my timing has nothing to do with Arya's warning or, or this bandage on my hand. It's fine. It's definitely not fine. It's probably fine. Now entering the facility. We'll begin with the game's premise, which is a novel pathogen appearing seemingly out of nowhere and spreading across the globe to cause life and society changing chaos. Now, like many post-apocalyptic stories, this premise is of course a little ridiculous. There's no way, <clears throat> what? Have you checked your phone lately? No, why? Oh! Okay, I guess it's not that hard to imagine a highly infectious disease taking the world by surprise because of a lack of leadership and foresight. Anyway, these events usually begin with what's called a spillover event, the exact moment when some pathogen jumps from an organism into humans for the very first time. We'll take Ebola virus as an example. Epidemiologists discovered a natural reservoir of Ebola virus in bats. They harbored it, but it didn't infect them. Over time, the virus mutated and mutated, and then thanks to some happenstance random encounter with a human, the virus had mutated enough to find a new host in people. Ebola is then an example of a zoonosis, an infectious disease that jumps into humans. Ebola, influenza, HIV, AIDS, rabies, and COVID-19 are all zoonotic diseases. But Ebola and other microscopic monstrosities are viruses. What about a zoonotic fungus, The Last of Us's canonical pathogen? Well, here is actually the game's real claim to accuracy fame, because the story tells of an outbreak of cordyceps, a real genus of fungi with around 400 species. And some of these species are in fact very famous for their ability to turn creatures into zombies. There are many different kinds of cordy, but I'm almost positive the researchers at Naughty Dog looked at Ophiocordyceps unilateralis specifically, a so-called zombie fungus that affects ants. It starts with some unfortunate ant picking up a fungal spore on the forest floor. That spore then burrows its way into the ant's exoskeleton with enzymes and mechanical pressure. Fungal cells then migrate to the ant's brain where they start secreting chemicals that change the ant's behavior. The ant starts to convulse and wander away from its colony. It then finds a leaf or twig at a very particular height off of the forest floor, and here the fungus secretes chemicals that causes the ant's jaw to lock shut. The ant then dies and the fungus uses its corpse to sporulate and sprout its fruiting bodies. These bodies rain down spores on the ants below. It's grisly stuff, and I think The Last of Us did an excellent job at capturing the look and feel of something so simultaneously beautiful and grotesque. Ophiocordyceps then does zombify hosts. No known species of fungus, though, affects people in a similar way, but it's not that hard to imagine. Let's look at another infectious pathogen, the rabies virus. The rabies virus infiltrates mammalian brains and prevents proper signaling between neurons, leading to frenzied, aggressive behavior. And in dogs, foaming mouths, mindless biting, sounds like a kind of zombie to me. A zoonotic fungus that could affect the infected in a similar way is some kind of plausible. And mind control in nature is not rare. There are zombie fish and snails and cockroaches and mice. Even the common cold hijacks your behavior more than you think it does. Why do you think you sneeze when you have a cold? It's the virus irritating your tissues to help spread itself without your permission. You're not quite as free as you think. Kevin, can we burn all this booger stuff in here now? Get the flamethrower, will you? You are probably now more than ever very aware of pandemic containment tactics and you might be a little irritated by them. Just take some solace in the fact that it's not an exclusively human problem. Remember those ants that were zombif- Ooh, vanilla coconut. That were zombified by the Ophiocordyceps fungus? Well, 
These ants and other species of ants don't just take all the zombification laying down, evolution provides, as it often does. One species of ant affected by mind control fungus will clean each other of spores using their mandibles, and if that fails, they inject each other with formic acid to prevent spread. Another species, if there's a sick queen, they will bury their sick queen in a grave underground so that it won't affect the rest of the colony, and another species of ant socially distances. This ant, when it senses that itself is sick, will separate itself from the colony for a number of days and then act aggressive towards any ant that tries to get near it. Yes, it is socially distancing before you even knew about it. And if that ant can socially distance itself without complaining about not getting a haircut, so can you. And I bet it would even wear a cute little mask without saying anything about it. Ooh. Moving from premise to player now, the most iconic enemy type in The Last of Us has to be the Clicker, a morphologically transformed human that hunts using echolocation and a series of iconic clicks. Now we know this technique is obviously possible. There are echolocating animals that we know of, and it's plausible because sound is a lot more rich in data than you may think. For example, a bat's brain can take reflected clicks of its own and interpret signs size, shape, distance, even velocity of an object. And clicker form here might even follow that function. Look at that splayed open head. It is grotesque, but it might also serve a purpose. It could be like a sort of dish to collect and amplify echoes. That's such a good idea, in fact, that barn owls thought of that millions of years ago. And adding to all of this plausibility, of course, there are humans that can echolocate. Some humans who have lost their ability to see in an amazing display of... That's fine, Arya, right? You should leave. Very quietly. One more thing. In the game, it seems like the infected stay that way for a long time, leading to a very long-lasting pandemic. This, too, is plausible, and that's because any infectious disease guided by evolution and natural selection alone eventually comes to some sort of equilibrium with its host. More specifically, it establishes a balance between infectiousness and mortality. You see, the agent wants to transmit itself, and so something with, for example, very high infectivity and a very high mortality rate, like 100%, could be an evolutionary dead end. That's why in our world, infectious diseases tend to get less virulent over time and not more. In The Last of Us, it seems like it has struck a balance with this fungus between very high infectivity but low mortality. That is, un that is unless you get chomped to death. And this would ultimately aid in the fungus's transmission by allowing it to burn through a population for a long amount of time. It's probably fine out here. What would the world actually look like after an apocalypse? I think The Last of Us was ahead of the curve here, depicting it less like some burning hellscape, just walk away, and more like a reclamation of nature. And I think the game is exactly right. One of the first books I ever read as a young adult, a science book, was The World Without Us by Alan Weissman. In this book, Weissman has a fascinating thought experiment to consider. What would the world look like if all the humans suddenly blinked out of existence? Oh yeah, I'm not really here right now. Well, in talking with experts and scientists and engineers, Weissman painted a picture of a world that looks almost just like we see in The Last of Us. Without power and human preservation in just a few years, buildings crumble and pipes burst, concrete gives way to grass, street signs yellow in the midday sun. This is a more realistic apocalypse, and if you want proof, look no further than Chernobyl, where this thought experiment basically happened. Another aspect of the game is the inability of the global health establishment to handle the shock of a pandemic and the rise in conspiratorial, quasi-religious theories with an almost political spin that spread misinformation far and wide. Now, like we considered the game's premise, this is of course totally ridiculous. There's no <clears throat> what, what? Have you checked your phone lately? No. Why? Oh! 
Yeah, I guess the game's pretty accurate there too. Yay. The last Last of Us feature we are going to consider is critical to the story, fungal immunity. Aria, are you finishing my science videos in here? What, like it's hard? What are you talking about? I programmed that sentence. What about this one? Yes. And this one? Yes. And? Is it? This one? Da -ba -ba -ba. Take a deep breath in and out. <sighs> There's a good chance one of you just inhaled at least one fungal spore. <laughs> Don't worry, it's fine. All of us do this every day. It's everywhere. But that's okay because the human immune system does in fact go after fungal cells. Most of us never develop a serious fungal infection despite this. And unfortunately, you can prove that to yourself rather easily by looking at the immunocompromised among us like HIV and AIDS patients and see just how easily they develop unfortunate fungal infections. My point is, is that if the human immune system does go after fungal spores, then in theory something like the wonderful anomaly that is Ellie is theoretically possible. And that's more or less all the science you need to know about The Last of Us. The game is a masterpiece, and I would go one step further in saying that it is the most accurate zombie game. Until next time. Ah. Alright, do you have a flamethrower? Because I don't want this one to like sprout, sporulate, whatever the word is. Now exiting the facility. Oh, I'm right back here with Aria. Then why did we have to close the Anyway, thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in creating this very episode. Today, I especially want to call out research assistant Space Chicken and visiting scholar Vinnie Prevo. If you want to join the facility staff right now, if you want to join the 1,100 nerds, over 1,100 nerds who are right now in the Patreon and the Discord, giving me episode ideas, memeing my assets and setting up their own D&D &D nights and game nights and radio stations, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill right now. And if you support us just enough, you get your name on Aria here each and every week. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds of you. So I don't know how to pass the... I know we're probably very tired of all the pandemic response stuff right now, but if anything, we should consider this a dress rehearsal for the big one. There will be another pandemic, and there's nothing to prevent it, evolutionarily speaking, from being much more infectious and much more deadly. So take it seriously, and just take it from the last of us. Wear a mask! It's not that hard. I haven't gotten a haircut in a while. Ooh. Ow. Is it done yet? No? This is probably fine. Right?